A shadow bank is a non-depository financial institution that's exempt from normal banking regulation. These firms are responsible for creating tens of trillions of dollars in debt and equity capital across the global financial system. Join me as I take the esoteric power of capital creation from behind the closed doors of Wall Street to your Main Street. I'm Ben Summers, and welcome to the Shadow Banker Secrets Podcast, based on the book I wrote by the same name. Today, we're joined by Edward Hamamjian. He's the extremely bright managing director of Geosphere, a successful RIA and ETF manager. So, Ed, it's been a little while. It's uh, really good to see you again. Um, nice to see you, Ben. How have you been? What's been happening since the last time we spoke? Well, you know, the market turned uh, turned negative. <laughs> all markets, as uh, as we all know, um, I certainly didn't anticipate the level of the downturn. We were expecting a downturn, but nothing like what, what we got. The, the markets have been down. Um, again, not not terribly surprised about it. I don't recall if we talked about this the last time we spoke, but uh, it's my expectation. Uh, and I think I'm, I don't think I'm alone here that 2023 is really going to be a bloodbath. I think 2022 is just the um, sort of the setup uh, for what will probably be a, a pretty challenging time. Um, so you mentioned that you were a little bit sort of surprised by this. What, what, where did that expectation come from? Well, I was expecting a garden variety correction of, you know, somewhere around 10%, maybe a maximum of 15%. But what, what was different this time, and I hate using that terminology, but what was definitely diff different this time was the so-called safe part of client portfolios, you know, the barn portfolios, that fell off a cliff. And... What, what really kills me about it is that I, I've been expecting that for the last several years, and, and I've been wrong. But I was right this year, only, <laughs> only uh, you know, I don't think I was nearly as prepared for it as I should have been. Um, I can tell you in client portfolios, you know, we definitely use some hedges, uh, you know, the TBT, uh, which is an inverse of the TLT, which is the 20-year treasury. We had that in our bond portfolios, but oh my goodness, this was so much worse. You know, I don't know if you've looked at the 20-year bond and how, how it's done year to date. I think it's still down over 20%. I think it's down more than the S&P itself at this moment in time. And that... That I think most people were not prepared for. And, and you know, candidly speaking, I don't believe I was prepared for it either. We, uh, we should have been better prepared because we were expecting this. It was inevitable. The Fed told us they were going to raise rates. Where was the surprise? And hence, it was a surprise. Yeah. Well, I kind of suspect uh, maybe the silver lining in the bond market is that the Fed cannot raise and hold forever. Right. The the institutions have got far too much low interest debt on in their balance sheets right. to sustain any kind of substantial rate increase over the long term. And so eventually, and probably not too far down the road, I think the Fed's gonna have to acquiesce. Um, so for what that's worth. Yeah, well, you know, Ben, I, I agree. Um, and I've been saying actually for months. Uh, to clients and really anyone that wants to listen, that uh, I believe that the inflation problem is not nearly as bad as the Fed and others seem to believe. And the reason why I say that is that there are many deflationary forces out there that have been there for a long time. You know, everyone forgets why was the Fed for the last, what, 15 years trying to create inflation. I mean, they've been lowering rates consistently. They've been, they've, been, they've, been they've been fighting deflation and not inflation. And the primary reason for why I believe that that's been happening is that, you know, most inflation um, 
is, uh, is well, inflation is always a direct result of uh, fiscal policy and, uh, and, and the Fed policy. But the, uh, the factors that the Fed looks at is wages. And uh, and what's been happening with wages? And I don't know. The last time I checked, places like India and China and countries like that, you know, these folks are producing uh, engineers, doctors, professionals at all levels, and these folks are are willing to work at less wages than, let's say, the average American doctor or American engineer, you know, et cetera. And, and with that in mind, uh, that, those are deflationary forces. You know, we saw some inflation. Well, I shouldn't say that. We saw a lot of inflation, of course, but that was a direct result of COVID, supply chain disruptions. Uh, you know, when, when, you, when you stop things all of a sudden, uh, you're going to have a reaction, and that was the reaction. But commodity prices over the last three, four months are down 30, 40 percent. I mean, I think the Fed has done a good job of accomplishing its goal, and I suspect that they're going to go, they're going to stop raising rates much quicker than what the market is anticipating, and also much quicker than what they're leading on to. You know, when Bullard came out last week with all his inflammatory comments um, and the market sold off huge uh, sell off that that one day, I just didn't buy it. I, I, I saw it as a short term issue. And sure enough, the market very quickly stabilized and we're inching higher. So we'll see. But I don't I don't buy into any of that. And I'll, and I'll just make one other comment. Sure. Um, you know, the uh, the comment you made early on that, you know, next year will be much worse than this year. I, I really don't see it in the same light. I, I see that we are in a rolling recession. Um, and and what I mean by that is is very simple, that different sectors are being hit at different times. And, you know, let's let's not forget what the classical definition of in um, of recession is it used to be two consecutive quarters of ne of negative GDP, which we got in the first and second quarter of this year, and all of a sudden, you know, we're changing the definitions of words in the dictionary, and why not use why not do recession uh, while we're at it? Uh, I believe we are in a rolling recession. I believe that recession started some months back. And that's the reason for the market sell-off. And what I know about markets is that the market will rally long before the economy begins to improve. And uh, that's always been the case, right? It's a, it's a forward-looking indicator, six to nine months on average. And for those reasons and other reasons, I think we're going to have a banner year in 2023. Uh, likely after March. Well, I hope so, right? Um, see, for what I, the, the challenge that I see is that, and, and I think to your point, is that monetary policy does not and cannot be designed to affect the economy in a predetermined and engineered way. And what I mean by that is, sure, you can increase the monetary the money supply, but that doesn't mean it's going to trickle down into the segments of the economy that would be required to create economic equilibrium. And I'd say that for the last decade plus, you've had really two titanic forces between the Fed driving inflationary policy, right? with really, really poor Main Street fundamentals. And I, I just, it, it doesn't seem that that has substantially improved. Now, again, to your point, the supply chain shortages, uh, the disruption in the labor market, right, uh, that's arguably been exacerbated or, or was exacerbated at some point, at some point by um, stimulus paying people not to show up to work, right? Um, I'd argue that's not a good thing, 
right? That 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 create that further exacerbates imbalances. Um, and again, to your point, what's happening in the markets is not a real time indication of what's happening on Main Street. And I'd say to a greater extent, um, it hasn't even been a, a realistic indicator. I mean, I, I think if you look at the run up in the markets from say 2012 to, to 2020, and you compare that to wages, for example, over that same period, there wasn't necessarily a very meaningful um, correlation there, right? So, um, in in short, it's chaotic, and, and I think this this is sort of presents kind of a nice segue into how you and I each view the world and how it may align and how it may differ, right? So, I think as most people know, from my perspective, it's a fool's errand to attempt to predict the future, what the markets are going to do, right? Absolutely. I totally agree with that. <laughs> right. And so, um, again, our thesis would be all you can know is all you can know. And what we can do is look at the worst case scenario that we have ever encountered and to <clears throat> position yourself to be protected from that, right? To, I mean, a- instead of, say, a rolling defensive strategy versus, all right, now it's time to be aggressive and, and, and pursue growth, that those ideas are constantly and simultaneously reconciled, right? And I know there's some, I know there's substantial limits to that when you're looking at, at public markets, but if you don't mind, tell me a little bit about your perspective on the relationship between predicting the future versus um, an awareness of what any unpredictable downtime potential may present. And then I guess we can take that one step further because I, you, you do have your own ETF um, and it's not, there are not very many uh, financial advisors who have developed and, and run their own ETF. So that's a, extremely uh, six, um, impressive accomplishment. So if you would tell me a little bit about, again, the sort of philosophical perspective and how that dovetails into how you run your your advisory business and 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 your ETF and a little bit about you know all that stuff. Sure. So philosophically, um, I'm I'm in complete agreement with you that no one should be trying to predict the future. There are too many variables to know. Um, I have, however, you know, over the years looked at secular cycles. And uh, and and I've I've come to the realization that there are cycles in virtually every market. Uh, there are secular cycles, uh, long term or cyclical cycles, shorter term, and and I and I give that some weighting in my decision making process. It's not everything, but I think it's important to understand those differences. So you know, to give you a simple example of what I'm referring to. You know, if you go back to 1982 uh, and you look at the S&P 500 uh, and you look at what happened from 82 to the year 2000, you know, we had a secular bull market. We had many reasons why the market should have gone down during those periods, including crises of every kind, currency crises, wars, you name it. It all happened in the 90s and uh, uh, 80s and the 90s. But the market went up and it went up substantially, one of the greatest bull market runs in history. And what immediately followed was a secular bear market from 2000. uh, I make the argument that the bear market was from 2000 to 2013. And the only reason I make that argument is that that was the break even. If you put $100,000 in the market in 2000, you broke even in 2013. So a pretty good good run with no returns. And then after that, it broke out. So with that as a backdrop, I think it's important to understand the type of market you're in, uh, and that will help you invest properly. So I've had the benefit of managing both value portfolios and growth portfolios during all of these periods. And I've had the opportunity to see results. 
So as an example, from 2000 to 2013, my value portfolio beat the pants off of growth by a lot, like over 400% over, the, over that same period. Um, and then, of course, everything changed right around 2013. Growth, the growth portfolio took over. And value did okay going forward from 2013 until recently, um, but growth just did ex extremely well. Well, I think we're in the reversal back to value. You know, if you look at value investing over growth investing, value has outperformed growth by a lot. You know, if you look at it over long periods of time, 50 years, 80 years, 100 years, no question about it. So I believe we're back to that period of value. And I define value as companies that have pricing power, good dividends. And I think dividends are very important in this conversation. Uh, they, they tend to be well-established under levered companies uh, and and they uh, they have excellent price to free cash flow levels, which I look at closely and you know I've done uh, quite a few studies on that topic alone. So I believe we just had a shift from growth to value and I, I believe that this shift will likely last some time. you know when I looked at this, from a historical perspective, these changes seem to happen every 10, 12 years or so. And I think we just experienced that change. And even this year, as awful as it's been, if you look at value stocks and what, you know, I'll give you an example. What were the ultimate value stocks in the year 2022? Uh, energy, right? <laughs> Look at an Exxon Mobil or a Conoco Phillips or, or, or you know, all, all the stocks in, the, in, in, in that category. How did they do? They're all up 30, 40, 50 percent year to date in, in, during a period when the entire market has essentially collapsed across the board. Right. Growth stocks are down 30, 40, 50. Value stocks are up 30, 40, 50. That's a shift. That's a shift that you can look at and see clearly. And, uh, and once you recognize that a shift has taken place, I think it's really easy from that point on. You know, don't overthink it. Don't predict the future. Only buy value stocks until, until you prove it otherwise. And, uh, and I don't see any indication, you know, whether on a technical basis, or on a fundamental basis, that there's going to be a shift back to growth anytime soon. And I'll give you two quick examples to prove it. You know, I would ask anyone, pull up a chart, put up a, a put a, put a General Mills on the chart, and contrast that with a Nvidia. Nvidia is like my favorite stock in the world, but I don't own it <laughs> because <laughs> I'm I'm not masochistic. <laughs> so. Uh, Put the two together and you and, and the contrast is unbelievable. It's unmistakable. And the decision making gets really simple when when you compare them side by side. That that sounds like a brilliant approach. The question that feels open to me lies in the identification in the market shift. Equities markets can move fast, right? For example, in February 2020, we saw this sort of flash crash, right? And now it happened to recover quickly, but I mean, it's there, right? 2008 right. happened pretty quickly, right? right? So how do you position yourself or move in a way such that you're not subject to these draconian drawdowns that require huge returns to recover? Well, one of the one of the basic shifts that uh, I've implemented in my management style is I've tried to take my personal biases out of the conversation. You know, if, if we go back to February of 2020, we knew that something was up, <laughs> but, mm -hmm. uh, 
But uh, I was looking at the markets and individual positions on a technical level. I own the stocks that I had owned for the last seven, eight years, nine years uh, in my portfolios for my clients. And, and, you know, I'll give you examples. I owned NVIDIA, Microsoft, Apple, Google, Netflix, et cetera. You know, I owned all of those stocks and, and more. Um, and at the time, I felt that those were the market leaders. Uh, when February rolled around and I got strong indications on a technical le level that the market was rolling over, I did what I considered to be the unthinkable at that time. Uh, I sold half of our portfolio. I sold 50%. And at the time, it worked. Uh, it wouldn't have worked this year. Uh, I put about 40% uh, into the long-term treasury, the, the TLT. And, and even though the, the S&P fell 35%, we had a total decline of only 13% over two months. Um, and what was great about it was that we also identified the swing, the, the bottom of the market, not because we have any special tools or, or I have some sort of deep insight into anything. I just looked at the volume, the volume of selling, and I compared that volume relative to pass market bottoms. And when you look at it over long periods of time, it was ridiculously obvious. The volume was 10 times, I'm, I'm exaggerating, but it was, it was something that was obvious that just looking on a chart, it was clear. So we, we immediately sold out of our uh, defensive positions mm -hmm. and went back into the market in April and we had a really good year. You know, the uh, my my fund, my growth fund in, in that year ended the year about forty two percent higher, um, and I was happy with that. It could have been better. You know, we, we didn't do what the uh, the Ark Investments did. Of course, we haven't lost what the Ark Investments have lost either since. So, um, so it it was it, it was a strategy that we were able to use, but. That strategy, I felt, was still lacking. Mm -hmm. Even though I had success, when I was reflecting back on it, I felt that there was an element of luck to it. And I don't like luck, okay? People rely, you know, people give us their life savings. We don't need luck. We need, we need a little more. And, and so I implemented the strategy an additional strategy, a layer on top of everything we were doing. And that's effectively what we do in our ETF now. So in the ETF, we only buy stocks. Now, assuming they meet all my other criteria, we only buy stocks that are in confirmed uptrends. That means they're over their 200-day moving average, they're over their 50-day their, their moving average, and in almost all cases, they're over their 20-day moving average. Now, we have a fundamental side, we look at that, but if they don't meet that criteria, we do not own the stock. And if anything changes in the stock, if there's a trend change and they stop breaking down, we don't wait anymore which would have served us really well earlier this year had we had this uh, strategy fully implemented. We implemented this in the middle of the year, uh, around May, uh, and uh, when, you know, when I realized that this was not a garden variety correction, uh, but in fact, a real, a real bear market. Uh, so I, I certainly appreciate uh, the thoughtfulness, the intelligence, the effort that you put in to portfolio construction and trading. I, I think you're probably aware that that is relatively rare amongst the retail advisory community. So, yeah. and, and so it's, that, that's a, a foundation that's, you know, you can't, you can't teach, right? Just caring, right? Um, taking it one step further from our perspective, right? I would take that, qualitative description of what you're doing, as you know. And then we would need to see 
what that looks like objectively in quantitative terms. Sure. Um, and so I think as we talked about before, what we would do is we'd say, okay, let's take um, the strategy, the assets, the portfolios, um, and look at their historical performance across a minimum of one market cycle. So I, I generally say 2007, January 2007 is the most recent that you go back to. You referenced looking back to at least 1980, right? Where you have the beginning of this, this secular uh, bull market that ran for 20 years. Um, but only with the statistical analysis of that historical performance do you really know, right? How strong is the strategy? How well the thesis maps to uh, the actual performance of the market itself? Sure. And so uh, we talked about that uh, in, in a previous conversation, um, developing some intuition around uh, the quantitative, the purely quantitative perspective that we take and, 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 and encompassing uh, your approach. Um, Kind of taking that conversation one step further. Where are you with that? I understand that the ETF is relatively new, right? So uh, we would have to be rigorous and um, objective, no cherry picking, right? Uh, no fitting data to really get an accurate measure, but we, we can do it, right? Um, if If we're looking at, um, again, whether it be one of your sort of legacy portfolios or whatnot, um, would this ETF represent, would that be sort of the pinnacle of everything you've done to date? Is that the evolution? Is that strategy the evolution of, of your experience and into one optimized strategy or what does that no. look like? Okay. No, the, the ETF is a growth portfolio, which at this moment in time happens to own all value stocks because okay. value is the only part of the market that is rising and in fact in a confirmed uptrend. Having said that, the uh, one of the most important components to fundamental analysis from my perspective is looking at the relationship of the price of the stock to the free cash flow that a company is generating. And the way that we define free cash flow, we define it is it's a strict definition of exactly what's left in the cash register after one year when everything has been paid, including maximizing taxes, every, everything. Sure. So when you apply that metric, right, you, you can put a multiple to the stock price. So as an example, if you have, let's say, $1 of free cash flow and the stock sells at $10, then that's a 10 multiple. Well, you know, we have uh, historical data. We have an empirical study demonstrating uh, how well stocks do that have low price to free cash flow over long periods of time. So our empirical study of 60 plus years looks at that. Uh, and and we, we make the argument and in fact prove it in the empirical study that uh, if you do this for long periods of time, that those stocks will significantly outperform. And I don't even want to throw the numbers out because it is so outrageous that it's it's almost too good. So I don't I, I don't want to cloud the the argument. I'm simply saying that uh, the the price to free cash flow when it's low outperforms over long periods of time, over decades for sure. And that is the very first component that we use, both for our growth portfolios and our value portfolios. So. I do plan on launching a strategy, an ETF uh, that will be based on the Dow Jones Industrial Average and will be based on our 60 year empirical study, which is also, it was done on the Dow Jones Industrial Average. 
Now, I've been managing that strategy and separately managed accounts across um, hundreds and hundreds of client accounts for the last 11 years, and, and it has done extremely well. And in fact, that strategy has done better than the growth portfolio this past year by a lot uh, because growth has been underperforming and value has been outperforming, as I'm describing. But, you know, we'll see. We'll, we'll see what happens. I, 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 we, we plan on going back and offering both strategies, both the pure growth and a pure value. Right now, we have only the pure growth. Okay. Um, so you mentioned the new strategy is predicated on the Dow Jones. Yeah. In addition to this uh, PE uh, approach, right? Right. What's the relationship between the Dow and the, the, the actively managed component? So that strategy, and, you know, we, we, I actually have a name for it. I, I, I call it the, the Geosphere Price to Free Cash Flow Dow. <laughs> long, long, stupid name, but it describes what, what it is that we do. Um, so we only use the, the stocks of the Dow Jones Industrial Average, and we compare our returns to the Dow Jones Industrial Average. But by utilizing the price to free cash flow uh, model that I'm describing, we exclude stocks that are in the Dow Jones Industrial Average that have too high a multiple to their free cash flow. In other words, we only include the ones that meet our criteria and we rebalance annually. So every single year on January 1st, we throw out those stocks that no longer meet that criteria and add in those stocks that meet that criteria, again, of only the stocks of the Dow Jones Industrial Average. And then we compare side by side. And our empirical study is based on that strategy. And, and again, it's done extremely well. And we, we offer that strategy in separately managed accounts. Understood. Yeah, that's a variation on a theme of another RIA that uh, we, we've worked with, where they look at the S and P, and instead of looking at a price to free cash flow relationship, they per, they took a technical analysis approach and uh, eliminated the the worst performing uh, constituents of the S and P five hundred. And I'll say uh, we did analyze that portfolio. And it did beat the S and P. It performed better, but it was still subject to the macro forces, right? So, like the S and P was down fifty percent, uh, and the drawdown duration was five years, right? Over the last you know two decades, um, that's still really bad. To what extent do you think that this price to free cash flow? Uh, management style or, or, or strategy will uh, mitigate that, that drawdown and duration? So our 60-year empirical study showed the extent was very dramatic. Um, the, uh, our portfolio over that 60 years outperformed, again, in an empirical study, not in actual dollars. In an empirical study, it outperformed by a significant amount. Uh, I'm off the top of my head. I want to say 13% per year for 60 years. Big numbers, big numbers. Mm -hmm. The actual portfolio, which, which we've been managing now with actual accounts, with actual money, has outperformed the Dow Jones Industrial Average on average by about 3.5% per year for the last 11 years. So I believe it's done extremely well. Uh, in real terms, uh, relative to to the Dow Jones Industrial Average, and in fact, I would make the argument that it's done extremely well across all indexes because that portfolio has outperformed the S and P. It's also outperformed the Nasdaq, uh, the QQQs, uh, again over that same period of time, and that's a value 
perspective. We're, we're looking at stocks that we consider to be deeply valued by, by utilizing that price to free cash flow analysis. Now, of course, there are other components to, to that analysis, but that's, that's the primary one. Yep. Well, speaking of the other components of that analysis, that's exactly where my head was going, right? So um, we're talking in terms of the expected return, the geometric mean of historical performance yielding a better expected return, 13%, 3%, depending upon the time frame and, and, and the, uh, the, the particulars. But I think we're on the same page here, right? To, a, a, a meaningful and accurate analysis has to take into account all four statistical moments, yes. right? So in addition to mean, which is the first moment, the variance, the beta, right? As we right. take into account, but I'd say even more importantly are the third and fourth skewness and kurtosis, where we're looking at, okay, the average is a lot higher, but when it gets bad, how bad does it get bad? And how long does that last, right? And so have you had a chance yet to have a look at what say, um, the drawdown, drawdown duration would be for these higher expected return strategies. Yes. And uh, yeah. Yeah. So l- l- let me give you a, a great example, right? Recent history, uh, sure. COVID, the COVID plunge in 2020, uh, the, uh, uh, the S&P fell 35%. Our portfolio did fall a full 18%. Uh, during that the the three week mm-hmm. period that uh, that that took place, uh, I was I was keenly aware. Uh, the flip side to that is the S and P ended that year at about an eighteen and a half percent return, including dividends and and whatnot, and in that portfolio ended the year at almost the same. Um, I think we were slightly higher by by a, a half a percent or more, uh, but that's it. Uh, like we didn't significantly outperform, but we didn't underperform. I consider our performance to be that we didn't fall as much as the S&P. Sure. Right, the, the S&P fell 35 and, and, we, and we fell under 20. I think that significant uh, uh, outperformance, right? From a risk adjusted perspective, uh, but on an absolute basis, year end, it was about the same. Understood. Yep. Um, and that that brings up a, a, again a, a good point and a, and a challenge that, in my experience, seems really inescapable when you're dealing in public markets. Is people like yourself and others? I mean, we've got some of the most sophisticated quants in the world on our platform that we've talked about before. Um, just like yourself, have come up with extremely uh, insightful, well thought out and effective strategies that outperform benchmarks. The market influence is too pervasive to escape, right? And so like you, again, like it takes someone of your caliber to substantially outperform the S&P, but there's still a substantial drawdown there. Now it's way better, right? Um, And that's not a knock against you. I'm kind of knocking the market you're in, right? But like, obviously, like you're, you're a great example of what it looks like to do um, about as well as can be done, right? Right. So, you know, it's it's really difficult to um, uh, to get clients to stay put during the periods of turmoil. Sure. Like, like for example, now I, I have to say we've been pretty successful in that because I've been saying to clients for years, uh, it's your time in the market that will determine exactly how well you do. I mean, there is a reason why the average retail investor has near zero returns when the market's given us an average of 9% return. There is a reason why, because they try to time the markets. And and someone like me, you know, I, I do technical analysis and I have resources that the average person would not have with all these resources, with my skill sets, I still miss the, miss the timing. This year was the best example. Uh, you know, I, I should have known what was happening. And I, by the time I figured it out, I, I felt the damage was done. 
and and now we we have to fix that damage. It's important that people stay in the market. Uh, you know, next year when we have two opposing views on this, you know, and lots of people think that it's going to get much worse. I can tell you every technical analyst I know, and I know some, I know some of the big ones that you see on TV. They're all telling me that the market will likely go to, you know, the S and P will likely go to 3,000, 30, between 3,000 and 3,200 level before we have the final bottom. Well, they may be right. I just don't think so. Uh, and, and the reason I don't think so is because I think they're, disc, they, they're not taking into consideration uh, what the market has already done. And when this, this uh, recession began, I believe it, it began, it's, it's already begun. And we're ho however many months we are into it. And they don't they don't look at that. They don't consider that to be a factor. Well, I think they're wrong. And I will tell you this, they were wrong in 2020. In 2020, when, uh, when I said it was the bottom of the market, every major technical analyst was saying just the opposite. They weren't looking at the volume. They weren't looking at sediment. They weren't looking at the extremes, both in, with professional money managers and retail investors, those extreme sentiments uh, almost always mark the bottom of the markets. Well, if you look at sentiment today, I don't know if it can be any worse. You know, I don't know how many professional money managers uh, are not saying exactly what we started the, uh, the podcast with, that next year it's going to be substantially worse. Everybody I know is saying that. Mm -hmm. And and what I know from uh, past history is when everybody agrees, it is always wrong. It's always the opposite. <laughs> so so and and you know for obvious reasons, right? If we all agree, that means we've already positioned for that. So mm -hmm. you run it's it's simple supply and demand. You run out of sellers, and the only people left are buyers, right? That's you only have demand uh, and low supply. So the market has to reverse. And I see that coming in the coming months. You know, if, if, if I had to guess when the bottom was and not predicting, just guessing, mm -hmm. uh, I yeah. would say the final bottom would be in March. And the only reason why I say that is because March has mocked other important bottoms in markets, right? We can go to 2009, March of 2009, that was the final bottom of the financial crisis. March of 2003 was the final bottom of the uh, dot-com crisis. Um, for whatever reason, there are certain months, October and March, seems seems that major bottoms happen in those months. And, uh, and I just don't think it's gonna be different this time. Understood. And again, not only do you have the intellectual capacity and the willingness to make the effort to develop these insights, but you also have the experience to support this perspective. Now, I feel like I'm kind of at a, a fork in the road. Like I, I want to trudge ahead, right, and, and go further down. But before we do, it's probably worth taking a step back to your origin and development um, how you got where you are. Um, I know it's not been extensive, but the the exchange and engagement that we've had so far, uh, and what sort of prompted and motivated us to to connect at all. Um, but yeah, let's let's go back to the beginning if you don't mind, and, and tell me a little bit about how you got where you are right now. Sure. Uh, what was the evolution of your career, and what drives you going forward? So. The way I would describe it is that I, uh, I am a serial entrepreneur. And, and the reason why I say that is because I just look at my history. Uh, you know, very early on in my career, my 20s, I wanted, I wanted things, which I could not afford mm -hmm. <laughs> with, the, uh, with the jobs that I had. I was a mortgage broker at one point and Long story short, so I decided uh, I need to achieve certain minimum standards. So how the only path that I saw to get in there quicker was to buy businesses. 
And I did. I bought pizza houses. I bought coffee shops. I bought tax businesses, leasing businesses. I developed property. Um, ben, the way I would describe it is I got my hands dirty. I put my hands in everything and really developed an understanding of how business works. Okay, if, if you've never met a payroll, if you've never had to meet a payroll, you don't understand business. And, you know, and I, I tried to explain this to lots of people that have, have never worked for themselves or had employees that they, had, they were responsible for. So it started there, and, uh, and I did that for about 15 years, uh, very successfully, by the way. I packaged everything, sold them off, and uh, um, I, I read an article in, in the paper about the next great uh, uh, profession, uh, and it was uh, being a financial planner. And, uh, and I opened up the, the want ads in the newspaper and saw an ad for a company called IDS, uh, which was later acquired by American Express and today is Amerif uh, Amerify. Uh, and they were advertising training programs for financial planners, which I found interesting. I didn't know anything about the profession. I answered the ad. Uh, I, uh, I was hired. I was very successful there. Uh, and then uh, I decided I wanted more. And uh, I, wanted, I wanted to be, uh, I wanted to trade stocks. You know, I was a financial planner. I did asset allocation. I did financial planning. But I wasn't buying or selling the actual investments. I was handing that over to someone else to do, right? If you're an advisor and you hand it over to a mutual fund, you're not actually managing what's in the mutual fund, someone else is. I wanted to be that person. I wanted both sides of the, of the coin. And, uh, and so I did. And uh, I, I uh, worked for some large firms, decided I'm better off starting my own firm. And in 2005, I broke away, opened up an RIA, left the broker world, came into the RIA world, and I have not looked back. And in that process, you know, I've been managing separately managed accounts. And when I say that, uh, I have specific strategies. I have a, a, a growth strategy, a value strategy, a real estate strategy, a bond strategy, uh, and then various versions of those, more specialized. And I've been managing all of them and you know the 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 beauty of 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 what we do is that there's software out there that allows you to manage hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of accounts as if they're one. So I make a I make a trade in in one of my uh, models, and that trade happens in every single client portfolio at the same time, at the same price, in the same percentages. And, and that technology has allowed me to manage these different strategies in multiple client accounts at once. And through that process, I came to my ETF and I realized that the one thing I cannot do <laughs> in the separately managed accounts um, was I could not use option strategies because there is no software sophisticated enough to be able to distribute option contracts. And so one of the strategies we do in our, in our uh, ETF uh, is that we sell covered calls. Uh, in other words, we take in revenue uh, each and every month. Well, I couldn't do that uh, in, in the, uh, under the normal uh, software that was available. And I wanted to do that because I see that as a true value added uh, uh, management that, that we can offer to people. And, and, and so that's one of the reasons why we launched the ETF so we can add that component on top of the other things we've talked about. Understood. And I think one thing that may be lost on people that really resonated with me that really differentiates people more than anything else is early on, you said you wanted things and that want 
is what drives people like us to do things that other people aren't willing to do. Yeah. That want can overcome a lot of shortcomings, right? Oh, sure. Just oh, yeah. just because you're willing to persevere and fight through. And you can't teach that, right? People either have it or they don't. Like Bear Bryant used to say when he was interviewed, like, how do you keep your team so motivated? Right. His answer was, I don't. I just don't recruit unmotivated people. Right. So that's and that and and that that's I think a lot of people listen to this and they'll try to they'll latch on to, well, here's some technical advice, or here's this tactic, or here's this. Oh, one opportunity that he might have had that I didn't have. But at the end of the day, and this is not an overstatement, I would argue, and I'd be hard, I doubt you'll disagree with me, it's that you want things more than most people. And that want is what got you where you are. Is that a fair statement? Oh, Ben, ap- absolutely. I'm, I'm also a highly disciplined person. And, uh, and, and I, I can't overstate that because I, I have many friends and acquaintances and, and whatnot. You know, I'm in my office at 6 a.m. every day. I don't leave my office until 6 p.m. every day. I go to the gym at 9 o'clock at night. <laughs> the And it's clockwork. It's mm-hmm. clockwork. I will not miss a day. I will never be late. Obviously, I don't have to be in my office at 6 a.m. There's nobody. None of my staff is here. They don't get here till 9. Uh, but... It's 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 a discipline. It, I, I think it's a combination of what we're, we're talking about. It's you have you have wants and desires. You also have the discipline to do things day in and day out with no excuses. And and that's that's my world. Uh, there is there's no excuses in my world. Yep. Uh, and, and just to take that point one step further, as it was described to me early in my my athletic career, like when you're competing at a championship caliber, no matter what the domain is, right? Excellence is an all the time thing. You can't turn it off and can't turn it on when you need it, right? Yeah. It, it has to be built into who you are. And yeah. that's why when you do, you do things like show up at the office at six o'clock, who cares? Like there's nobody, you're not punching a time clock. There's nobody yeah. who's going to like ding you if you're not there, but it's part of the discipline yeah. of maintaining that, that, precision of focus and that standard of excellence all the time for the sake of doing it that gets you where you are. Right. And I think that's another thing that most people really overlook. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. It's, it's hard to do, or at least that's, that's what everyone tells me. Um, The, uh, uh, but I, but I think it's necessary. Okay. It's uh, the, the, the term that you used about excellence. Uh, Excellence is an, everyday ongoing process. Uh, it isn't in a destination. Uh, there's no such thing as excellence. So there's, there's the striving for excellence. And, uh, and that and you, you either live your life uh, by those standards or you don't. Uh, if you don't, it's easy. Just find someone that does. <laughs> uh, That's right. and let, them, and let them handle things for you. So I, I, I'm glad I got the opportunity to sort of touch on that a little bit because in the professional world, um, disappointingly to me, that doesn't come up enough. Most people are just happy with good enough, right? And you're trying to coax people. And, and it, it's really a, a breath of fresh air to, to you know, come across you, someone who sort of gets it, right? Um, but not, not to go too far in, in, down that, that motivational track. I think, I think we sort of made the point. Um, on more of a personal side, when we spoke before, um, you've achieved a, a relatively high level of success with Geosphere, right? Right. Um, and I think you mentioned that your son is entering the same field, and you yeah. wanted to establish a legacy for him and uh, position him to succeed going forward. Because, I, I, I mean, again, I think it's safe to say that um, business now – is not like business was 20, 30, 40 years ago. No. Things are harder on a lot of fronts, right? Yes, absolutely. And so um, I believe like when we first spoke, you expressed to me that was one of your motivations for reaching out, right? You, A, right. wanted to maximize and continue to grow your practice for your own sake, 
given your own goals, but there's also this consideration of legacy. So tell me a little bit about that, um, where you're going, what sort of family considerations might be at play, and what motivated you to reach out to us to begin with? Well, it's, you know, I... I see my I, I see the obvious, right? Uh, I'm not a spring chicken, as they say, and uh, and I have lots of people that rely on me, uh, and I take that very seriously. You you have to take that seriously. It's people's life savings, their investments, uh, their their wants and dreams are all in your hand, and and it's a responsibility you have to think about day in and day out, which I do, and and so. I felt I needed to set up a structure that if something were to ever happen to me, uh, that that people's lives will not be impacted in a negative way. And the way I, uh, I approached that was uh, with my son. I brought my son into the business. I, maybe I should say it differently. My, my son decided to come into the business and uh, and I've been training him for the past ten years. Now, keep in mind, he brings a lot of firepower to to, to the game, right? He's a he's a he's a philosopher. He's a let's call him a retired professor, uh, teaching philosophy, literature, uh, history, which I think is a fantastic foundation to do what we do, right? We uh, we're gauging sentiment, we're gauging human behavior. That's what markets are, right? Uh, greed and fear. And, and the higher your understanding, the better your understanding of those components, uh, the likelihood of you being a better money manager is, is substantially increased. So I brought him in, in, into the mix and he is uh, he's doing qu quite well, doing all the things he needs to do. And, and this is just in case something happens to me. Now, let me be clear. I'm I'm in no rush to go anywhere. <laughs> I love what what I do. Uh, I, in fact, I don't even know what I would do if I stopped doing what I would do. So, uh, you know, I expect to, to be doing this for a long time, uh, decades, really. Uh, and and but there there is there there is someone behind me, you know, and uh, and and that person is ready to step in at any time. Uh, and he is he is involved in multiple levels, including doing research, uh, helping us pick individual stocks that we add to our portfolios, or even more importantly, deciding which stocks to remove from our portfolios. A harder task than 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 the first. <laughs> um, sure. So so yeah, so that's where we are right now. Understood. And so. When we first spoke, uh, the context of that conversation was your motivation to continue to grow. Uh, and additionally, um, well, that dovetailed with what our initiative and agenda is, where, again, uh, for those who may just be uh, first exposed to us with this particular um, engagement, we're an investment bank. We've got hundreds of thousands, over a million high net worth individuals in our ecosystem, um, but we're not retail facing. And so to date, we had really just let that sit. And so over the last couple of months, we decided, all right, we're going to make a concerted effort to partner with the best retail advisors so that we can serve this retail high net worth client base and provide them an outlet. Um, the biggest challenge is that a candidly most retail advisors aren't any good like they don't take the sense of ownership they don't have the intellectual capacity um they don't make the effort that ed does right and so that was appealing to us um and then beyond that uh the ability to understand this wholly quantitatively driven perspective and having the intellectual wherewithal and agility to implement that within their existing business and portfolio construction uh, techniques, perspectives, and, and strategies, um, that's hard to come by, right? And so we, obviously, this is disseminated largely to 
our following who has been brought up to speed on our perspective, which is like we talked about at the beginning of this discussion, you can't predict the future. Like we can have that conversation, right? Like we can right. talk, like I may be a little bit more uh, bearish. You may be a little bit more bullish, but the point is that it's moot. It's it's not relevant because right. from our perspective, allocation decisions are made based upon what is objectively best over a, sub, a sufficient period of time. And then you allocate to that. And then again, um, most of the people in our ecosystem, when they look at the world through that lens, they realize that the pervasiveness of public market influence makes it impossible, at least in my experience, to protect yourself completely from market draw uh, the market bottoms, right? Right. And when you look at institutionally managed strategies that are executed within private markets where arbitrage opportunities exist that by definition can exist in public markets because of their efficiency, right. then you can disconnect yourself from these market bottoms. And instead of getting, say, a 50% hedge, you can get a 100% hedge without compromising the upside, right? And it sounds incredible in the literal sense, impossible, not feasible, if all you looked at is public markets. But when you are, when you've seen this side, or when you've seen behind the curtain, so to speak, um, I'm not saying there's no place for public strategies. Like I am eager to analyze your SMAs and your ETF, soon to be ETFs, plural, right? right. Um, I think the the expectation from our side is that those publicly traded assets don't comprise the entire portfolio, right? Oh, absolutely not. Right. Uh, but that that is exceptional, right? So, I mean, if you, again, you talk to most retail advisors and there's, there's kind of an implicit mandate from the SEC and by extension FINRA that, oh, if you're retail, then no more than 10 to 15% of your portfolio should be an alternatives. Now, if you flip the you flip the page, you look at institutional portfolios, there's 60 to 70% alts, right? right. Now, and then you, you go back and you say, well, when you're when you're looking at institutional grade funds, the minimums are much higher, right? The typical retail investor, it's not accessible to them, right? But then if you structure a fund of funds, like we talked about before, right? Now your entire client base can right. aggregate its capital. And now you can create some diversification, right? Within this one entity, as opposed to having a limited as a single retail investor um, that may not have the financial wherewithal to, uh, to get there. One of the things that we do, we do advise our clients outside of what we do, okay? Uh, so the uh, most of our clients tend to be business owners of one type or, or, an, or another, and we advise them on other investments that they're doing outside of our control, uh, including analyzing uh, the, the value of what they're purchasing, Analyzing the, the the cash flow, future value, uh, et cetera, and then and then incorporating those other assets uh, with their public assets, as as you described. And uh, so, when we present to clients, we're always presenting the full picture. It's not just what we do. So, in an indirect way, we're doing. Very much some uh, some some of what you're describing here when you talk about that fund of funds, where you know uh, folks are investing in private assets and and illiquid assets and and whatnot. We are advising them on doing that. We just haven't had the 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 structure that your firm uh, provides to 
to to be able to point to uh, point to uh, your firm and and say you know what we can accomplish all of this uh, utilizing our partners. Uh, they our our clients are sort of forced to do it. You know, there's a plaza down the road. Let's go buy that plaza, and it's and it's got six units in it. And they're doing that, and we're helping them do that, you know, including helping them find find the financing, structuring the deals, offers, all of it. Uh, like you know, when I, when I said I get my hands dirty, I got my hands dirty very early on in my career. That has not changed. Uh, I because I I bring that experience to the table. Uh, you know, most of our clients utilize that experience, and and. You know, to, um, to their credit, they understand that uh, in in the end, it, they're better off by doing so. Yep. And uh, again, another example of you being literally exceptional relative to the the majority of your peers. Um, and it, again, it's an extension of taking ownership, getting your hands dirty, and and actually caring about the outcome. Um, so. I think, as we talked about before, in, in our case, our re, the retail um, investors that we would be referring to you have been taught to really distill what is potentially an infinitely complex domain into really a handful of measures, right? We, we touched on earlier expected return. That's the geometric mean of historical performance across a minimum of one complete market cycle. If you don't know what the average what the average is across the bottom, you don't know anything. All right, that's number one. Then secondly, which is also very intuitive, is what's the drawdown, the drawdown duration, right? Because again, the big appeal for public assets is their liquidity. Well, what good is that liquidity if you're down substantially at the time you need liquidity, right? So um, understanding the drawdown, the drawdown duration, um, is right there with the expected return. And then the third one that really stands out that is really esoteric, but not terribly complex is the omega ratio. The omega ratio sums all of the gains over history. And again, history has to encompass a minimum of one complete market cycle, whether it's 2007 or 1999. Right, the further back, the better. But regardless, at least one market cycle. Um, but if you sum all of the gains, and you divide it by the sum of all of the losses, then you get a comprehensive picture of the quality of the investment. Because now you you literally see how's the total upside compared to the total downside. Um, and then finally, the Modigliani measure, um, which it's only second order. It's closely related to the Sharpe ratio. Basically, second uh, total second order um, risk, but the output is scaled into a user friendly format. So the output is a percentage. So that if the Modigliani measure is fifteen percent, and you're comparing it to another asset that's got a an expected return of nine percent, you know that hey, this this is better probably on a, on a risk adjusted basis. So that you can compare things uh, apples to apples and a very intuitive percentage output. I kind of describe it as the iPhone of uh, quantitative analytics because, again, the math is not super complex, um, but it's complex enough. You don't need to understand it. What you need to understand is that the output, like the iPhone, is user friendly, right? You don't need to know how it's built. You just need to know the output, uh, what the output means. And that, and of all of the the measures, that one's probably the most intuitive. So. We, we really focus in on those four. Um, obviously, there are tens of risk-adjusted performance measures that you can look at. Um, but when you take sort of a cost-benefit analysis, um, those four viewed in concert give you a comprehensive and accurate measure. And now what happens is when you've measured the, quali the quality of a strategy or a portfolio or an asset over time, again, a minimum of one complete market cycle, and given how much information was contained in 2008 and colored even further by 2020, right. you have a very almost complete picture 
of where you stand and what you can expect when bad things happen in the future. Now, it's important to note that by definition, black swan events cannot be predicted. You don't know what you don't know. And things that have never happened before can happen, right? Things can be worse than they were in 2008. So, but that's just, that's just intrinsic to uh, epistemology, right? How we know what we know and what are the limitations on knowledge. But it's, I think it's also important to note that it's impossibly 100% accurate when measuring the quality of any uh, investment or, or strategy or portfolio. Again, the thrust of this partnership between our firms is this philosophical alignment on evaluation. And you, again, are a a rare example of not only the intellectual capacity, but the experience and the care and the ownership that you take with respect to your clients and their portfolios. Um, That that is the uh, the recipe for a, a very successful uh, partnership. Your approach is harmonious with our perspective that it's not competing in any way. Um, as a matter of fact, the fact that you the fact that you do have very strong strategies run either through SMAs or through ETFs that just improves the palette that increases the palette of assets that we collectively have at our disposal to do what's best by the clients. And what's best is very easy to determine. It's just what the measures dictate when they're properly utilized. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and you know, when, when I speak to a client, we we evaluate what's appropriate uh, for that client. Uh, you know, sometimes people come in and they think they're big risk takers and they're not. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. I, I usually figure it out in the first five minutes. Uh, and, and I, I always look, we, we, we want people to be able to sleep at nights. So you can't, you can't be worried about every fluctuation in the market and that requires balance. Uh, the great thing about the balance is that uh, the balance will likely over time give you even better returns than to be, let's say, all in tech stocks as an example. You know, you did great until you didn't. <laughs> and then you gave back all of the gains that you had and then some, you know, the, the same arguments with things like Bitcoin, et cetera. So, uh, so we're a big believer in diversifying balance, value, growth, uh, the credit markets, uh, real estate, uh, business assets uh, across the board, structured notes, uh, whatever is most appropriate to, to give the client uh, the, uh, the comfort they need to, to live their lives without worrying about day-to-day fluctuations. What do you say to those? who are skeptical of financial advisory and how do you impart the confidence that they were able to achieve at least at some point in time with their own self-managed strategies? Sure. So one of the prevailing um, asset allocation strategies that the entire financial service industry uses is the uh, this concept of the efficient frontier. And the efficient frontier is very simply, for those that don't know, it's, it's, a, it's a thesis that was written by a gentleman by the name of Har- Harry Markowitz in the 50s. And, and it was his PhD thesis, and he got a Nobel Prize, brilliant man, and his, and his thesis is valid. However, the application of that thesis in my view, is not valid. And let me explain why in a, in a very brief way. So the thesis is based on um, the concept, if you have a straight line and you have stocks on one side and bonds on the other side, what combination of the two uh, do you need to get the best return with the least amount of risk? That's the efficient frontier. Well, that's that seems like a simple exercise. And the industry uh, 
uh, presents that. That's what every financial advisor is taught, you know, when they're when they're putting together their asset allocation models. Uh, but it misses one key element. Uh, and and it was not intended to be used in this way. So uh, this is nothing against the founder uh, of the thesis. This is the way that the uh, it's it's applied. And and what everyone forgot was that markets have cycles. I talked about these cycles very early on in our, in our conversation. The stock market has secular cycles. The bond market has has very distinct secular cycles, right? Bond values are, have an inverse relationship to interest rates. Well, if you look at interest rates, interest rates have a very clear cycle. So if you map the efficient frontier decade over decade, there are some decades where the efficient frontier works beautifully. And in fact, if you have, let's say, the 60-40 allocation, the most popular asset allocation that's, that's uh, recommended by financial advisors, it's, it's worked extremely well over the past decade. But I'm here to tell you it is not going to work well over the next decade. Um, as, as I've uh, demonstrated uh, through my uh, research work. So if, if you map it decade over decade, what you'll find is that the, the same asset allocation works very well in one decade where it's a conservative portfolio. And in the next decade, it becomes an obscenely aggressive portfolio. Why? Because the so-called safe part of your portfolio doesn't perform well. If you're in a rising interest rate environment and 40% of your portfolio is falling in value, like the 20-year treasury did this year, down over 20%, that's the safe part of your portfolio. That type of asset allocation doesn't work. And, and what I try to uh, instill in clients is that there is no single formula for achieving long-term success, okay? It's work. And, and the work is assessing a person's risk in their portfolio each and every day and making adjustments along the way, reducing the level of risk. So as an example, I would give you, uh, right now, we don't, own, uh, we don't own very many bonds. It used to be 40% of our portfolio, it's less than 10% now of our client portfolios. Now, what did we do to replace that? Well, that's one of the reasons we launched our fund. You know, we use our, our option strategies to mitigate some of that risk, which is a whole lot more work for me, but it's the environment that we're in. You know, if, if you look at the secular cycle of interest rates, they're multi-decade cycles. In other words, when interest rates start moving in one direction, up or down, they tend to move in that direction for decades. Think of 1982, you know, as I cited earlier. 1982, I happened to be a mortgage broker. I was a mortgage broker and I had two mortgages. I had a 15% and a 16%. Now, needless to say, mortgages have come down since then, right? 41, 42 years, mortgages have come down and they came down to two and 3%. Well, they just went up to seven, seven and a half percent. The cycle shifted. There's been a seismic change. And when those changes come, you have to be aware of those changes and allocate accordingly. And what was a great strategy for the past 40 years may not be so great for the next 40. And I'm not saying the cycle is gonna last that long, no one knows, but it's gonna last more than a year, I can tell you that, because history is on my side on this one. And I've looked, I, I went back 300 years and I looked at these cycles and I averaged that the average interest rate cycle is, is about 26 years. So if interest rates just started moving upwards this past year, then it's likely it's going to continue for some time. So what diversification means moving forward, that has to be examined. And there are many alternatives. And, and Ben, the, 
the, the, the topics that you've brought up about the, the various ways that uh, the various ways, products, services that, that you, you're utilizing to create diversification, I'm all in on that because I don't buy into the, uh, the efficient frontier and that mo model that the average financial advisor uses. It does not work. And it will certainly not work in the in the coming decade, and that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> no, I, I agree. I yeah, I I love it. I'm right there with you. I mean, and we've done something similar here, right? So the metrics are great. The efficient frontier is not right, but right. just like you, if you take if you take those metrics and you utilize them properly with a better understanding of what market potentials exist and and operate outside of the constraints that are implied within modern portfolio theory, um, then the world was potentially your oyster. <laughs>